I am here to tell you about magical innovation. Innovation which has always thrilled mankind's fantasy and has been seen as this, the fountain of youth. We were also thrilled as kids when we heard about the lizard being able to regrow his tail after it was cut off in a fight. I hope you have never cut them off, though, from curiosity. Today's kids rather watch this, the Marvel heroes who have this amazing capacity to suddenly grow a new leg or organ just to be able to accomplish their missions. But back to reality, because what I would like to talk about is, or probably going to be, everyday life reality for every third person in this room. So please raise your hands if you have often, or probably chronically, joined pain. Well, yeah, we are talking about osteoarthritis and in and out damage of our joints which is a real epidemic of our aging society. Every third person over 45 has been suffering from an articular cartilage damage. No wonder if you are one of them. It is not a deadly disease, thanks God. But once you get it, almost every aspect of your life can get impacted. Like, for example, the sports, what you can do, or how, where you can do them, or how good you look while you're doing them, is getting, yeah, different. Or the activities you can do with your kids or grandkids, getting limited. And you probably must live on painkillers, and you must live with the long-term side effects. And not to forget the very obvious high socioeconomic impact what a chronic epidemic disease like this can have, namely the very high costs. This study su suggests or concludes that up to a half a percent of a country's GDP can be spent on osteoarthritis every year. But what is actually osteoarthritis? In order to understand that, let's have a look into one of the mostly impacted joints into a beautiful knee. We need to have an even closer look. So, this is how it looks from the inside. The bones are covered with this smooth surface, the articular cartilage, which has a crucial role by reducing friction and biomechanical loading, and with that, to protect the joint. As it doesn't have any blood vessels, interestingly, it doesn't have the capacity to heal. That means once a lesion happens in this cartilage, it won't heal. In the contrary, it will worsen and will progress eventually to osteoarthritis. And this is how osteoarthritis very often begins. <laughs> in younger ages, with 20, 25, when we sport the most active, a sport injury happens. Even if the injury is not that brutal like here, a smaller one can be the start of a long and painful osteoarthritis career. Other conditions typically and very usually also causing osteoarthritis like overweight, as well as O or X legs. These conditions, namely, are all having a permanent uh, mechanical stress on the cartilage, which will also progress into osteoarthritis. Smaller defects at the beginning will be treated with medications, painkillers, natural lubricants. There's a quite a big arsenal here, but believe me, none of them will provide cartilage regeneration. And because natural healing is not possible, further therapies like surgeries will be necessary. Without going into detail, most of these surgeries won't provide sufficient cartilage regeneration either. They will help for a couple of years, but the symptoms will recur. And this will be the point when the orthopedic surgeon will recommend the implantation of a metal prosthesis as last option. Well, artificial joint implants are great inventions, and they have completely changed or probably even saved the lives of hundreds of millions of people since the first implantation of the modern hip prosthesis in 1958. But we must see that they are made of metal and artificial plastic like Teflon. So this is clear that they won't provide cartilage regeneration. And there is another problem with them, and this is related to the fact that our joints are highly sophisticated biomechanical machines. And that's why, especially knee joint replacements, very often get loosened or dislocated. This happens, by the way, the more often, the more sport or other activities that person has been doing. 
If these problems occur, a second surgery, a so-called revision surgery, is necessary, which is, as you can see, is actually the replacement of the replacement with a bigger metal prosthesis. If this surgery also fails, there is no more therapy options available. So the surgeon will need to perform a joint fusion, which is stiffness, which unfortunately means permanent disability for the person. So what we have to see that in, in, when once a metal prosthesis was set, there is no way back. This metal will permanently invade the joint and change its anatomy. So we can say it is a one-way street. This is also the reason why doctors try to delay the implantation of those metal prostheses into older ages in order to postpone the further later consequences, which in worst case can be disability. But what if the story started, as I told you, typically with 20, 25, and the person right now, with 40 probably, is in need of a metal prosthesis? So waiting, no sports, Painkillers were the options, but there must be a better way. And in order to find this better way, some enthusiasts all over the world started to develop a biological alternative for those prostheses, especially in order to close this therapy gap where a 45-year-old typically can get stuck with osteoarthritis. And here comes the magical innovation which I have promised you at the beginning. And I can tell you this is not science fiction anymore. It is real science, or even more, it is implemented therapy. We call it tissue engineering because indeed we engineer tissues. We grow them in specialized laboratories into certain maturation in order to treat a tissue defect. You can imagine this probably like in a plant nursery where little trees are grown until a certain age before they get planted into a beautiful garden. And the most relevant therapeutic area where tissue engineering can help already clinically is the area of cartilage defects or osteoarthritis. And this is what I spent most of the time of my professional life with. So let's have a look how does it work. So the surgeon takes out a small specimen of the cartilage, which will be transferred to the specialized laboratories, where the cells will be isolated, then grown, and matured into a pre-grown cartilage tissue, which, after implantation, for example, in the knee joint, will completely integrate into the surrounding cartilage and will provide a natural regeneration, and with that, the healing of the defect. Instead of the implantation, of a metal prosthesis. So it probably sounds good, but you can rightly ask me, does it work? And I can tell you, it does. We have implanted more than 60,000 patients with a tissue-engineered cartilage, and we have 20 years follow-up data in the meantime. And these data shows that 85 to 90 percent of the patients had excellent clinical improvements, and they didn't need further surgeries, which is fantastic in this therapeutic area where sequential treatments are the normality. We have to see that even in case of those 10 to 15 percent therapy failures, the knees of those patients are not in worse shape than they were before, because we haven't changed the anatomy of the knees. So the implantation of a metal prosthesis for those patients still remains an option. And for the 85 to 90 percent of the cases, we can say that we successfully delayed or probably even completely avoided the implantation of a metal prosthesis. And this is great because these patients could live their normal life, they could do their favorite sports or activities unlimitedly. Or, if they fit enough, they can even run a marathon with 90, like this lady did. So this is really great, and it makes me very proud and, first of all, happy for those patients. However, there is something that is bothering. Have you noticed the numbers? We are talking about every third person over 45 having a cartilage damage. These are hundreds of millions of people worldwide. And we have implanted 60,000 of them in 30 years. So why that? 
without questioning the necessity of stringent regulatory as well as reimbursement requirements. Isn't that crazy that it takes so long for an innovation to evolve to therapy? And why is that? Is there probably something in the system which is slowing down progress? And if so, cannot we do better? Well, medical innovations are involving more and more complex technologies. Like in our case, tissue engineered implants are about novel cell culture technology with individual differences for each patient. But we have to comply with highly standardized, very rigid pharmaceutical regulations, which were, by the way, created for the mass manufacturing of pills. So I have experienced how neither regulatory nor reimbursement bodies in leading European countries have been prepared for those innovations. And because our systems are quite inefficient, but first of all, very inflexible and absolutely not prepared for the upcoming exponential technologies, innovations very often get stuck or get delayed for decades before they get implemented. Of course, innovations are also expensive, but the real problem actually is that our current reimbursement systems are not rewarding long-term benefits. But only innovations can bring better therapies, which can lead to less side effects, less further therapies, less disabilities, as well as to less costs. But if we don't implement our innovations, or slow, slowing them down, then all these benefits cannot happen. And this is a vicious circus, and costs will explode further and further, which is critical, especially in our current demographic crisis. But there is another problem in the system, namely different players, like for example doctors, hospitals, or health insurance companies, very often are working in silos and having diverging interests. I give you an example. In Germany, an orthopedic surgeon still gets paid more for the implantation of a metal prosthesis with all the long-term consequences instead of using a tissue-engineered implant, which could avoid further surgeries. Or in Switzerland, hospitals still get fully reimbursed for the treatment of a surgical error that they have caused. And health insurance companies are publicly committing that they are not interested in analyzing long-term cost-saving potentials because they are forced to watch short-term cost savings only. As long as doctors, hospitals, or health insurance companies are financially unincentivized in the best possible treatment of their patients, I suggest that there is no way to get to a sufficient healthcare system. Only if all these players have one and common interest, namely the best possible long-term health outcome of their patients, then we can get to a sustainable and affordable healthcare system. So we need a systemic change. We need to converge those diverging interests, which is not easy at all. And there are different approaches. And one of them is the way that providers like hospitals or doctors don't get paid for the provided services, like we do right now, but for the provided benefits. And there is a service, there is a system which was developed with that intention, and it has its only stage implementation in some countries, like in the US or in the UK, and it's called value-based healthcare. And in this system, doctors or other providers will get paid for the provided health outcome instead of the fee for a service payment model. Of course, we need to define what is health outcome. In case of a cure, it is obvious. If cure, unfortunately, is not possible, other values have to be defined, like, for example, improvement in quality of life or improvement in life expectancies. This is quite a shift, and not only in paradigm, but also in mindset. It actually needs the reinvention or the turnaround of almost every aspect of the system. And it is probably also comprehensible that not all the players are so enthusiastic about this shift yet, and they're resisting the change. We know that it is also in the nature of human being to resist change at the beginning. But we also know that progress means change. 
And history has taught us so many times that organizations or countries which were able to reinvent themselves were also able to be successful in the long run. So understanding that improvement in health must be not only the fundamental but also the measured value is crucial. And we must implement this principle with sufficient incentives to all, for doctors, for hospitals, for health insurance companies, as well as for us as patients. And then we can turn around our healthcare systems to make them affordable, accessible to all, as well as sustainable. And this is, by the way, also the required shift which is necessary to achieve the change, which is quite a buzzword in the meantime, however, I think is very valid claim, namely that we must shift our currently practiced sick care to real health care. And I'm very positive that we will get there very soon with all the upcoming systemic changes as well as exponential technologies. And I hope that once we're there, we will have very little worries about our joints. Thank you very much.